Uh, this is the uh, session on data science for energy applications. The first talk is John Grace uh, talking about uh, mapping top of salt with 2D, from 2D seismic. We're going to talk about uh, analysis of seismic data, which some of you may be very familiar with and others may not. But as we look through this thing, uh, we can see that there's bedded lines uh, there, which represent bedded rocks. And then there's these things that are between them. For a matter of scale, this is about 40 miles across, and it's vertically exaggerated, so it's about uh, 20, uh, six miles going down. What we're going to look for is these salt bodies within it. And we're going to try and map it, and we're going to try and map it through an unsupervised algorithm uh, that we've uh, put together from a number of uh, works that have been done previously. For those of you who are not familiar with seismic data, if you're in the medical community uh, and stay downstairs, think of it as a sonogram. There's a source of, of uh, acoustic energy, which is given off, and it goes down through the layers of the earth, and part of that energy is reflected back to the surface, and by timing and taking the characteristics of that returning signal, we uh, map both the depth of layers and other structures underground, and we can also get some idea of their relationship to each other after their interpretation. Seismic is typically acquired in cross sections as two-dimensional seismic data. And offshore, we usually have a density of about 60 or 80 uh, lines over an individual field. And what it would show you if it was moving uh, is that that white area in the center is a salt dome, and those polygons that are colored around it are oil and gas reservoirs, and those tend to accumulate on the sides of salt domes. The salt pushes the beds up, and the oil and gas accumulates there, and then there are wells that, uh, that are drilled down from the surface in order to produce them. Our objective is to take a massive amount of data. There's been work done on salt discrimination that involves just a few lines, a half a dozen lines. Uh, and the latest and greatest data. We, on the other hand, took 8,000 lines that cover the Gulf of Mexico, and our data, and 8,000 lines is about 250,000 miles, or the distance, basically, uh, from Houston to the moon. Uh, our data is also very old. It's all over 25 years old, so we have problems with quality and higher variance that wouldn't be encountered with brand new data. But we figure it if it would, we can get it to work for our data, then it should work much, much better for others. This is the Gulf of Mexico, and this is a distribution of the lines that we have. We have eliminated some of the area because it's not candidate for analysis of salt. But in this area here, we have a lot to work with, and you can have some idea of the spatial density of that which we have. We wanted to develop an unsupervised approach because there's an extreme premium to the time of the men and women who operate as geophysicists and interpret this data and process this data. So if we can restrict their attention to the more high level functions, then we will maximize the kind of return uh, to their time. We also wanted to take some of these experiments, proof of concepts experiments that had been done on a few lines and see if we could scale them up to thousands. And because we're going to be doing this without direct human intervention, we need some way to probabilistically uh, assess it. And we want to use it for a method, uh, as a foundation for further methodological research. We've taken two what we think are fairly orthogonal approaches. One is a raster approach, or a set of raster approaches that will uh, focus on seismic texture. The other is a vector analysis, so we could actually extract uh, geologic discriminators. So this is the texture, the idea of texture of seismic. Uh, we're going to do a transformation of that beforehand so that we expand one area of the range in which the data is collected and collapse another one. And after we get that done, we're going to apply a method that's commonly used in image analysis, the GLCM, or the gray level co-occurrence matrix. Now what the gray level co-occurrence matrix does is it actually operates on the very pixel level, so we have to zoom in pretty far. 
And now we're at the pixel level, and what we're going to do is go across each row and look at the probabilistic relationship between one color and another and use that to characterize the neighborhood of every individual pixel. So in this case, uh, we see here that there's a level four gray. This is a seven level matrix. So level four gray next to a one. So we're gonna go down to the fourth row in the first column and we'll put in a one. We'll look at another one as well. There's a three next to a two, so we'll put that in the third row in the second column. Once we're finished counting all of these occurrences for all combinations within the neighborhood, we're going to tally those up, divide through by the number of possible combinations so that we actually get a probability of the co-occurrence of gray levels next to each other, and then start to do statistics on that matrix in order to characterize the neighborhood. That's the principal diagonal, remember it from matrix algebra, I'm sure you all do. Um, so here's the kind of GLCM statistics we're going to do, and most of them have to do with where those cells in that matrix are with respect to the principal diagonal, because the principal diagonal is the line in which the exact same levels are coincident with each other. So we have, for instance, uh, the dissimilarity, which is measuring uh, linearly, weighting linearly, the distance to the principal diagonal, and that's what it looks like. We have the Contrast, in which that distance is squared, so it's worth more to be uh, further away. We have the inverse of that, which is the homogeneity. And these are the dimension reductions that you see each statistic provide in the colors. And finally, we have our old friend, you can't do statistics without having entropy. And so what you see from the original image that I saw, you can see how those salt domes are reflected in the reduction of those neighborhood textures to these statistics. So we'll do that, and we'll also do vector analysis, and all we'll do in that case is simply try and turn these reflectors into lines like this. And that'll allow us to, for instance, take densities of where we have bedded rocks versus non-bedded rocks, because where we have non where we have bedded rocks, that's negative information on the presence of the salt. And we need negative information as well as the positive information. So here the higher density of bedded rocks is shown in the lighter colors and the salt in the, in the uh, darker. We also want to take actual vectors and look for patterns in the vectors themselves because those are related to geologically understandable features like the sides of domes and low dipping or low angle beds in the cases where they're not there. So we see in this case that we have the high angle vectors on the sides of the salt, shows you where the salt is, and we're going to exploit that information uh, on those primitives to add to the, to the raster information. So we want to create a threshold function. We want to clean up what we've done. This is the original seismic image. This is the thresholding of those six parameters, the four raster and two vector parameters. And we use an algorithm from a guy named Atsu from about 30 years ago. In fact, we use it so much, Atsu is a verb for us. Um, and here is the result of the two-state classification of the seismic for, uh, salt versus non-salt. Pretty messy image. We probably need to make that nicer, and there are good morphological tools for making those much more geologically palatable shapes. And this is what we come out with at that point. But we also want to have some idea of our confidence in it. And we should be able to find differences in textures which are quantifiable as we go across our boundaries. So if for every single pixel in the boundary, we're gonna measure the difference, the difference in the gradient as you go across that, that boundary. And if there's high intensity of pixels on the outside, and low on the inside, that gives us a lot of confidence in the, uh, in the boundary. In other cases, there's very little difference between the two, and as a result, when we have such little difference in the two, uh, we're gonna reject that boundary as a candidate boundary for our analysis. We're also gonna retain these scores in order to grade things at the end. So 
Here, the black ones are ones we feel fairly confident in is because of the gradient of texture. The yellow and red ones are less confident in those analyses. Here's an example of a blue, as I mentioned to you in the movie that didn't happen. Um, the blue are oil and gas reservoirs that surround the salt domes. And the green is a high in our mapping of the salt dome. So we see a good correspondence there, and that makes us feel good about it because we've got a halo of reservoirs around it. This was an analysis that was done that also points to the kind of halo-like uh, distribution of the, of the hashed uh, green around the dark green, which is our mapping. And those purple polygons were the result of a project where some scientists in the uh, 1990s, which is coincident with the vintage of our data, went through and hand mapped off of, si uh, off of seismic where the domes were. And again, a good spatial correlation. And this is what we kind of come out with. We come out with a surface, an estimated surface at the top of the salt from these 8,000 cross sections that have been shot in seismic between 25 and 35 years ago. Uh, we got the lines out of then, and then we estimated the surface in three dimensions, given that fairly dense uh, matrix of seismic lines in two dimensions. And as well, you see kind of a halo sort of structure of the reservoirs that's surrounding it. Hmm. Wrong direction. Another example showing the intersection of that estimated salt surface with a seismic line from which, among others, it was taken. Another example of the same thing, where we've gone in, gotten the salt surface, then ex post matched it back with the location of reservoirs, and gives us confidence that we have a fairly good fit between our estimated functions and the actual reality of the geology. One more like that. And here's what we've done uh, on a gulf-wide basis. Because like I said, lots of experiments with three, four, or five different lines identifying salt on seismic. This is 8,000 lines put together in an unsupervised format. And this is our map of the top of salt, uh, with green being the shallower salt, orange being the deeper salt, gulf-wide. Because we have a method of getting some quality control on it. Here's the clipping of that original map by only the high quality, high confidence boundaries that we've estimated. And here is actually a map of the quality itself. So you can see the regional variation in the confidence that we've placed in our results with the high confidence being the bright green down to the purple and the pink being the you know, less C's, D's, and then even not shown is that which we have actually clicked out of the interpretation. We plan to go from here and do upgrades. Uh, as was mentioned in the second talk, for the hyperparameters, we should be sampling over those rather than simply setting them, and that applies to really all of the major parts of this analysis, from the pre-processing to the statistics and their parameters of threshold that we put into GLCM, how we do the salt score rather than a linear equal weight for all the six parameters. We could be testing different weights, testing different orders of polynomial functions, and end back to the confidence scoring at the end. So we think that we can also upgrade this by doing an unsupervised run. So there's the graded results of parameters and going through and then doing kind of an intelligent sampling of those results to find the boundary, where we would be waiting for both those that we had high confidence in and those that we were fairly confident were away from salt. We would then uh, take those weights and start what we would hope would be a supervised round of it, go through and find the parameters that resulted in the closest uh, correspondence between the salt and our estimations of it, change the parameters, and then rerun it again. Another variant, and probably a better variant of that, is that we put a person in this process over here who will look at an intelligently sampled subset of our analysis, 
make the recommended, uh, recommended changes in the parameter, and run the cycle one more time. So that's the essence of the analysis, uh, and it has its advantages and disadvantages, but that's where we stand now, and this is a description of our path ahead, and would be glad to take any questions that uh, time permits. Yeah, we have a couple of minutes for questions. And hi, uh, I have a question about the source of this data. Yes. So uh, uh, throughout your, your analysis, you, you pay heavy attention uh, to the texture of the map. So I'm wondering uh, how, how, uh, how, where does that data come from and how does um, uh, the process of improving the accuracy of this data influenced your research? The answer to the public, uh, the answer to the source of the data is that all of the original data that is shot by oil companies in the Gulf of Mexico, which belongs to the federal government, is released into the public domain. So this is all public domain data. The catch to it is there's a 25 year hold on seismic data, and that's why we're using 25 to 35 year old data. So you can get it, you can get it from the government, and I'd be glad to tell you how, it's not really hard. I mean, it's logistically hard, but it's not a, a matter of legal uh, uh, restrictions on it. It's non-proprietary data. Our uh, plans to improve it are to improve the hyperparameters in the pre-processing of the data, but we're not trying to improve the data itself because we don't have access to the stuff that was shot last year. That belongs to Shell and Chevron and folks like that. Any other questions? Or is somebody else? Oh, I'll just go quickly. Uh, two questions. First one, how, uh, how high can you get the resolution to be? Uh, I, mean the, I mean, between the, in the range of confidence of 90%, let's say, uh, what's the, the, the lens? The spatial, the spatial, spatial resolution, resolution yeah. varies. The spatial resolution varies as a function of the depth. The spatial resolution varies as a function of the diversity in surveys that were originally went into it. And one of the things that is down the road is our ability to match it, for instance, with well logs. Because other than the intersection of the salt by wells, and their recordation in well logs, we don't know what the exact truth is because all of this stuff is one to five miles under the surface of the seafloor. So with those kind of indirect parameters uh, that will give us some quality control, we have to wait on that as another stage. So we can't even say that it's off by 70 feet and at the moment we can't even give a probabilistic range. So we can do it by analysis of the go, uh, uh, gradient of texture and say we got a good difference or a bad difference and we can express that probabilistically, but it isn't like we've got the well log data in, integrated into it. Thank you for the very interesting talk and um, the very interesting approach that you chose to do salt detection based on uh, unsupervised learning approach. There has been a lot of approaches uh, to tackle the same problem. Mo no most noticeably, there's a Kraggle competition organized by TGS. Um, they, and, th and their approach is very different. Um, I would say the, the, the mainstream approach to solve this particular problem right now is to do supervised learning yes. and build a deep convoluted neural network to solve the problem. So uh, how do you compare your approach with the other approaches? Thank to you. get a good foundation for a supervised analysis, you need to spend a fairly, a fairly large amount of time with a geophysicist actually picking boundaries. That's not a practical approach for a no the number of lines that would extend from here to the moon. And so that's why we took the non-supervised approach. Thank you. Okay. okay. Thank Thanks. you very much. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Okay.